Uh, Theatre Clwyd is a huge arts hub on top of a hill in the middle of North Wales. So we have a 12-month partnership with Streamer, which is, is incredibly exciting uh, as we, we investigate and find out what streaming our performances could be, should be, can be. Um, so we've got, we've got a number of iterations, a number of pilots through that partnership as we grow our understanding. So I suppose the question that we had to ask ourselves is why would we want to stream our work out um, and, and what are the benefits? And if I think about 20 years ago when I started in the industry, we didn't really have anything online to compete with um, as, a, as a live product. Um, we did have cinema to compete with and we did have TV and theatre audiences were and still are um, arguably diminishing. Um, and we've, we, we need to make the most of our live aspects. So what we all talk about as theatre makers is the fact that we come into one room and ha uh, share a live experience. The really exciting thing with streaming our work, and the NT Live have proved this, um, is that we are able to reach more people with a live experience that captures that experience that people, as close to that experience as people can get if they were in that room. Um, so that's got to be exciting, widen, widening our reach. And for us, uh, getting it to people who wouldn't be able to come to the theatre here, um, maybe giving people an opportunity to re-watch the work without the cost of you know, £20 tickets that it costs to come to the theatre, feels very appealing. Live streaming gives us an opportunity to uh, talk to a new audience and an audience who might not necessarily respond to normal uh, marketing activities. Uh, it's a unique opportunity to really showcase the live experience through the digital world. How have I found the streamer system? Uh, the thing I like best about it is the fact that it just works. It's quite simple, you plug it in, you set an event and it works. Uh, the most important thing when we're, when we're putting on a live event, which is stressful enough anyway, is that you can rely on your hardware and everything we've seen so far, it's just a joy to work with. This has been, I don't know, something really, really exciting uh, here at, at Theatre Cloyd, just because it pushes boundaries to where theatre can, can go. Um, it means that people that can't normally see the theatre that happens here can actually see it. What really excites me about streamer technology is the way that we could both use a branded environment, our website, and also social media to, to really share what we do. We could have a Q&A online, which people can then engage with, and that might be the driving force for them coming to see that production. So the other thing we're going to be exploring during the partnership is what other kind of events we could use live streaming for. The things we've discussed outside of the live, live theatre productions are other live events. So for one of our major productions coming up, we're thinking of live interview with a couple of the, the star TV cast uh, members. Um, and, and being very specific that you have to come and watch it at this point to be able to speak to them and have access to that. Um, there's the other things that are revenue based about the, the conferences we have in some of our either theatre spaces or event spaces many of whom want to now live stream out to um, conference members who can't make it to the location and offering that as a facility, uh, of course with a little financial add-on possibly. Um, all of that means it will feed back into us working with our community and making arts projects. Um, so anything from marketing to creative engagement to family arts weekends where we want to share it in a different way um, as well as capture it in a different way um, uh, feels uh, like important things for us to explore during the 12 month partnership with the streamer. Hello! Uh, <laughs> that was a good start. Welcome. Uh, my name is Tamara Harvey. I'm the artistic director of Theatre Cluid, um, Kroiso, uh, Plinhamda. Uh, I am here with Catherine Parkinson and Richard Harrington, um, two of the actors from Home I'm Darling, and with uh, a whole uh, group of our members, Ray, um, who've come along to be our audience and hopefully to ask questions. Um, I know that some of you have seen the show already, some of you are seeing the show. Um, uh, those who have yet to see it, I'm just going to apologise up front if we give something away. Tough. 
you came, <laughs> you came to this. Um, and, uh, and so we're just going to spend about half an hour um, talking about it and, uh, and about the process. And I guess it's part of our wider desire to draw our communities into what we do here at Theatre Cluid um, to give you a greater understanding of the process and the, and the work and the, um, all the stuff that goes into putting a show on the stage. Um, so yeah, this is the next step of that. And um, thanks to our um, amazing partners at Streamer, we're able to stream this live to Facebook and to YouTube. So hello to everyone who's watching out there. Um, and, uh, and of course, Home I'm Darling, which is the production that we're talking about, is a co-production with the National Theatre as well. So, um, well, I'm going to kick off because Catherine and I have been working with the playwright Laura Wade on this production for six, six years. years. Not full time. We're not <laughs> quite that slow. Um, but we started together with a workshop six years ago, um, and uh, and so it's very much been formed um, in collaboration. Uh, and Laura was keen from the get-go to write. She'd worked with Catherine previously and wanted to write for her and with her. Um, and I think that's the first time that someone's done that, Catherine, with a, with a play for you? Um, well, no. actually, I mean, no, in, in, mm. <laughs> uh, when I was a student, so, uh, um, an ex-boyfriend wrote me something. That was my first. <laughs> that was your yeah, first. Right. <laughs> first specially written play. Uh, that was my first. My first job was um, a, a play called *The Age of Consent*, which was written for me. So I have had that privilege before. But, ne but uh, the the fact that Laura came to me and said I wanted to want to write something for you was amazing, and it's such a privilege because there is just a short hand. I feel like I've done quite a lot of different things for Laura and quite a lot of different characters as well. Some kind of pretty awful, unlikable. I've I played a sort of mean kind of Katie Hopkins-esque politician in something for her, and then um, I've also played quite sort of innocent, ingenuous characters for her. But I definitely feel like there's a um, connection <coughs> with her rhythms. I yeah. and and also just her taste. I sort of I I feel like maybe I'm quite like Laura on the inside. <laughs> And so I was extremely excited when you both came to my house and I made you some disgusting cookies. Do you remember? Yeah. I, I remember was, them being very nice. Oh, they weren't. They were from <laughs> Betty Crocker, that um, at Just Add Water, by the way. <laughs> I'll tell you that now. I and can't bake at all, so I'm just impressed I was at pregnant anything. with my first child and I just thought I've got to bake and uh, made you some... But that was before I knew what, the, what it was going to be about. Yeah. Um, so I made you some disgusting cookies and just felt very, very touched and... Um, fortunate and 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 then you know over the years just felt very excited about it because I just knew that whatever landed um, when she finally sort of wrote the play I knew that I was going to have the response I had to it which was like this is beautiful I love this and Richard you've come to it for this for this its premiere mm. um, and uh, we started it at the National Theatre. The first workshop was at the National Theatre studio. Um, we're now doing it in co-production um, with Theatre Cluid and the National Theatre. And, and um, how, how is that for you as a Welshman, um, doing a show that's made in Wales? Does it, <laughs> does it do a different thing or is it? Uh, well, when I, when I was asked to audition for you, I, initially I couldn't see, I didn't know any Johnnies from Wales for one. Um, plenty of Johnny come lately, but never anyone with a... Johnny is the name of, for those who haven't um, seen it, Johnny is the name of Richard's character in the play. And I, and it was sort of set in England's green and pleasant land, and I find it quite difficult to, to marry my voice with it. And I remember, I think I remember doing, probably covered most of Northern Europe, <laughs> different accents in the audition because <laughs> I just didn't think it lended itself to it and when I obviously got delighted that I was offered the job and then was able to use my own accent it was kind of a wake-up call for me really because um, I don't know I just I just thought perhaps working in the National Theatre you don't really get to hear regional accents 
my impression of it was anyway you don't get to hear regional actions that much um, so it was it was it was a wonderful thing to be able to do it obviously it's a it's a load off your mind when you haven't got to think of those things as well because as a Welshman you invariably have to change your accent quite a lot when you do stuff um, so rehearsing in London was great uh, and then coming back to Chloe it feels like coming home politically it, I'm not involved with any of all that. I don't really see it as anything. You know, for me, it's a judo mat, and you rehearse a play, and it doesn't matter where you put it on. And, um, but it does feel like an enormous privilege and a, a real um, coup, actually, for, for the National Theatre and for Theatre Cloyd. I think both benefit each other remarkably. Um, and what struck me, really, is the equality between the two theatres, because no one is treating this as a precursor to the London premiere. You know, it was really important for us to bring to you, first of all, Tamara's vision of it in Tamara's theatre. It just happens to be included. Um, and for the Welsh, predominantly, and, you know, uh, the surrounding areas, to feel that they are included in it, mm -hmm. and that the story is uh, also indicative of their life too, mm. because it doesn't necessarily equate with you know posh London. Mm. So um, it's been a, it's, I think it's just been a, a major you know um, achievement in that sense. It's been really lovely as well. I don't know how much of this you you guys have felt, but um, certainly for me as art with my artistic director hat on, how integrated it's been as a co-production, which mm. isn't always the case. Mm. But um, so we've. Uh, had we built the set here in Cluid. Mm. Um, the National Theatre team made and found and sourced the props. Mm. Um, some of the costumes have been from National Theatre, um, the Na National Theatre Costume Store. Um, the costumes that were made were made here by the Cluid team. Um, so it's been a real kind of marriage. Mm. Um, and it's been lovely this last week and a half, two weeks of tech, which is when we bring the, the um, show into the theatre space for the first time and put all of those things together because we've had a team from the National Theatre down here at Cluid and obviously we've had all of our Cluid team um, properly making it together which, mm. um, which has been glorious. Um, I'm aware that, that we're talking a lot and that you guys might have burning questions. Yes? Um, to what extent do the wonderful costumes help you get into those characters <laughs> and do you each of you have a favourite. Well, so, uh, should I repeat the question? <laughs> Would that be helpful? So, the question is to what extent, um, just because I've got a mic on, um, to what extent do, uh, do the, the costumes, which are beautiful, aren't they, um, help these guys get into characters and do they each have a favourite? Mm -hmm. Is that it? Well, um, mm -hmm. coincidentally enough, I am a bit of a vintage obsessive, <laughs> uh, which um, I said to Laura, did you know that I love and love vintage clothes? And she said, you do have some interesting pieces. <laughs> uh, so um, I, 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 you know, the, the costume fitting was just, I've worked with a designer, Anna, before, so I knew she would, I knew she would just do a beautiful job, but um, I think I actually wept in my costume fitting when I was just <laughs> putting the dressing gown on, which I appreciate is quite an actressy response, but they are. Uh, oh, dear. I so is think, that your favourite? Um, no, my favourite is... I, 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 to answer your question about does it help, it absolutely does, although I, um, like a lot of people, always like to rehearse in the right sort of footwear, but the, with the skirts and the petticoats, which I mostly rehearsed in, it, does, it means there's a kind of space around mm. you so people can't get that close. And mm. it's, so it, does, it certainly changes the way... Mm. I um, hold myself and stuff, mm. so it was very helpful and important to, mm. to wear the, the petticoat. But my favourite is the um, pink and white one that um, I wear in the second half, just because mm. on the hanger I wasn't, I didn't think it would be as lovely, but I feel like a sort of yeah. fondant fancy in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I love fondant fancies. Mm. And Richard? I, 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 um, I, I rehearsed the whole thing in shorts, I think, pretty much. Um, and didn't... Shorts and a jacket and a hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which is a great look. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes crutches as well. Cause of, uh, but um, I, th I think um, I wasn't... My character, Johnny, doesn't really get involved with the dancing. And so until I 
finally got to wear the high-waisted stuff, which feels so lovely on, mm -hmm. because I don't think we actually wear clothes. That we don't fit our clothes properly these days. I certainly thought my hips were down there, not up here. <laughs> um, and it just makes you move differently, and it's actually it's given a, an extra spark to, um, to the character. I found different ways of moving around the stage. I get inspired by watching the dancing. Um, because of the nature of Catherine's clothes, it, you have to, you know, maneuver yourself around it, which means that if Catherine turns, her whole outfit will spin, which you have to kind of go with that momentum, and that gives you just an extra dynamic in, in, in the show, which has been a joy. And um, Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a scruff bag, so... Um, <laughs> so I, which is your favourite? I, I think I, I do love the gimlet uh, outfit, which is a high-waisted brown sort of uh, stripy pair of trousers, <laughs> Beautiful pair of brogues mm. and a, a small little, I can't know. Uh, uh, shirt? Yeah, a little shirt. Well, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, I mean, the costume changes. I mean, I, I don't oh. go through what Catherine goes through. But no, it's, you don't. It's a, <laughs> but I thought I was being violated backstage <laughs> between, um, be, between scenes. So it was such a relief to get on not knowing that nothing is hanging out. Or <laughs> The unsung, yeah. I have to say, the unsung heroes of this production are the, are the dressers oh, backstage. Goodness, yeah. We have Gillian and Sandy, oh. and they, <laughs> they are extraordinary yeah. because the nature of the piece is such that there is a costume change yeah. or two um, every single scene, and they, and they have to happen really, really fast mm. because although we've tried to make the transitions between scenes as interesting as possible, ultimately you want to get on with the story yeah. and uh and so that you know all that was happening in our technical rehearsals was <laughs> me sitting out front going can we make that any faster oh, yeah, and yeah. and then performing miracles backstage yeah. um another question yes how did you arrive at the final set design uh, how did we arrive at the final set design well uh this is the first time that i've worked with anna fleischler the designer um who is both a genius and one of the loveliest people I've ever encountered. Mm. Um, and we, we looked at um, lots of reference images, and so those might be photos or paintings or um, uh, anything, really, that felt to us like it had a feel of the play. Um, we talked about the play a lot. Um, and then kind of a, a design starts to emerge. The, the idea of a doll's house was something that we talked about a lot early on. And indeed, the play A Doll's House um, by Ibsen is something that Laura and I had talked about a lot. Um, and so then it's a kind of constant back and forth. Anna will go away and uh, do a bit of thinking and a bit of kind of messing around in a model, model box and then show me, uh, me an idea and then we'll talk about that and then we'll make adjustments. Um, the National Theatre have this extraordinary team who can take... Uh, the model box, so you, you do a miniature, um, Anna's, Anna and her team do a miniature um, version of the set called a model box, and, and then uh, the National Theatre took that and do a, I don't think I've shared this with you guys, um, a, f a kind of film of what it will feel like in every seat of the theatre so that you can kind of check out the sight lines mm. and, and get a sense of that. It's, mm. um, it's incredible. Mm. Um, so it, it's just a very gradual process. Uh, and then some changes even happen kind of when you're in the rehearsal room and you realise that maybe you haven't got that bit of furniture in quite the right place or the actors will say, oh, what if, I, what the, what if there was a such and such here? Um, and that's the, best, that's the best version of working with a designer, really, mm. is when you don't quite know when, mm. The, mm. when the moments of discovery happened or whose idea was what. Mm. And, and all I remember that. the fridge always had a huge status from early on, the workshops yeah. that, that we've... There was always going to be a fridge. Yeah, and, and indeed, in that first workshop, um, we laid out uh, a living room and a kitchen and a bedroom in a big, um, one of the big rehearsal spaces in the National Theatre Studio. And part of discovering the play before anything was written down was watching the actors play in that, in that space. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Yes, over there. Um, I was lucky enough to attend the rehearsal. Um, how does rehearsing for a theatre production compare with preparation for television and film? 
over to you guys. That's an interesting question mm. and, and easy to answer because you don't really have any rehearsal on TV mm. and film, which is always a bit of a, a shock, but you really don't. <laughs> I mean, particularly in TV, because it moves so fast. I mean, when you're doing... I've done a couple films recently and there seems to be a bit more time, but it's, it's because the lighting takes longer. It's not actually... The acting department doesn't actually get that much sort of status. You grab what you can. Uh, and it just means that you've got to own a set much quicker. Like, um, I did a film recently called Guernsey... Well, it's called something else, but it's, it's a, I can't even remember the title. It's so long, but it's, it was... A, and I had a sort of house in it, and um, I literally arrived in my house and was doing shooting the scene sort of minutes later... And having to kind of own it, I, you know, all the sort of I had all these bottles because I made tinctures and things, and having to very quickly look, move around the space like it's yours is is, is difficult. When with something like this, um, the tech was a joy on this because uh, we had days to, and it also felt very much like it had felt in rehearsal. Sometimes you get on set in a, a theatre production and it feels completely different to how you'd imagined it, but it didn't feel like this. I feel like that in this case, we very quickly all felt at home, didn't we? And, mm. and, um, but you have a long time to, to, make, to actually believe it's your house, which mm. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Richard? Well, I mean, for me, it's, um, you, you do all that as homework prior to filming. You, you just... Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> now you tell me. Um, uh. I, I mean, and, and also... Um, the, the thing about film is that ex exposition is normally told and, um, you know, the, s the stories are much more punctuated, whereas with theatre, well, my experience of th theatre rehearsal, I mean, some actors like to re learn all their lines before coming in. Maybe I'll adopt that strategy next time. <laughs> but um, it's, so, it's so lovely to be able to create a character within the room with all the other actors and know exactly where you where you should pitch things, how the other actors' performances affect yours. Uh, and so you're almost like all, all of you together working a sort of uh, graphics board or a graphic equalizer board, and you're all trying to marry into the same piece. Mm. And that, that, that for me has just been yeah, wonderful. Right. Whereas, whereas in telly and film, it's, say if you're, you're given the lead in something, then very much you'll come in and you have to take that mantle and and run with it, and everyone sort of follows you around, you know, and... Um, and you learn it in isolation, don't you? And you, you do, and it's all, it's all, I mean, you, you, uh, what I do with stuff that I've done is just read and read and read and read and read and read and read, and invariably it's never going to change, and, uh, and then you come in and, and you just do it, and that's mm. kind of why you're being cast, mm. whereas you go through a, an audition process in the theatre, and they, I presume they think he's got the right energy for this, but nobody really knows what the character is yet, Mm. It has been written down and fully fledged in that sense, but the other dimension of it won't really come to fruition until you're all in the room. And then maybe the director will think, I've made a terrible mistake here. Um, in film, I don't think you get much chance. I mean, I have been sacked on things before when they think we've actually have made the wrong choice. And they can just take, him, take me out and plonk the one they want to put in. Whereas if you're three weeks into rehearsal of a theatre job and there's two <laughs> weeks left, I mean, we tried. Yeah. So <laughs> but, 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 you, but you will... Ooh, sorry. Um, you will fail. You'll fail so many times. You'll make a fool of yourself so many times. And as long as the production company can see that, that you're trying to achieve what they want you to, then the faith is put in you, and hopefully you'll get there and in the I end. And I feel but like we learned this together, we, we which is it. appropriate, no, because I, to me it's a sort of... It's a, it's a romance, this play, amongst other things. And I because I think that Richard and I work in quite similar ways. Um, Lazy, basically. No, <laughs> organic. <laughs> uh, I think it meant that we, the relationship happened and it, and it was about the ex between us, not about you or me, and that's mm. right. You know. I also think there's something really important about that idea of, of failure in any rehearsal room, that actually those moments where mistakes happen or mm. where you think that you fail are often the most revealing, the, the moments when discoveries are made. Mm. And, and for me, a large part of rehearsing a play is hopefully creating a space where you feel like you can try anything. Mm. Because all that we're doing 
is searching for the most interesting, the most mm. exciting way mm. to tell this story. And there are no rights or wrongs. Mm. And, and the brilliant thing about a new piece of writing is no one's done it before. So you're not even trying to do it differently. Mm. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's those moments, for example, when, when you don't quite know your lines yet and you're reaching for it and you don't know who speaks next. And there's that kind of glorious tension in the air of, that is so true in life. We yeah. don't know in life, in a conversation, who's going to speak quite next. It's thrilling, so, isn't it? Yeah, and so I, I think those... <laughs> Although la last night was a bit of a shock when I <laughs> completely said the wrong lines and tried to find out what clog danced my way on thin ice until I... You said I looked at him with hatred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or fear or panic or something. Disappointment, a... actually. Was, <laughs> that was the worst thing, yeah. <laughs> Hatred, uh, at least that's a positive, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, there's one right there. Um, there's quite a lot of, uh, um, there's quite a lot of um, choreography around the food and eating and speaking. How yeah. daunting was that? <laughs> oh. Well, Hugely uh, Tamara kept the, the actual physical food away from us till very late. <laughs> uh, and the first time we were, we, uh, some of you might have been there in London, when yes, yes. the first time we actually <laughs> encountered the food, was it was in a was in in front of an audience <laughs> an invited rehearsal an open rehearsal yeah but it's weird because in life you eat don't you and and sometimes you chat and it doesn't seem to have have any bearing on your life whatsoever but when you're trying to act and <laughs> it, it, suddenly then, you, lo yeah. you lose all your constitutions <laughs> and, and faculties all go out the window you know um, but the eating is one thing the pre preparation of the food and everything that I have to do oh, okay. uh, is, is the really hard stuff. And <laughs> yeah, you're not the one who's got to eat it. No. <laughs> but I can't wait for my husband to see this because I cannot <laughs> emphasize how much uh, of a non-Judy I am because mm. I'm really not a um, a cook, a, yeah, a cook <laughs> or or anything, even the basics. Mm. I don't. I mean, I've I can make coffee and that's about it. And I can't wait for him to see because I've tried very hard to. Uh, look as if I'm in control, you know, because she, she is, and um, it's coming more and more, and I think he'll be gobsmacked and, and start expecting me to do a bit more around the house. <laughs> <laughs> and it's partly about repetition, that as well, yeah. isn't it? That, that actually, um, with some things, like pouring the tea or buttering the toast, it, we just had to do it mm -hmm. a lot to, to make sure mm. that it became something that felt natural, because as, as Richard says, kind of something that you do all the time in life, suddenly if you're having to do it in a play, you can mm. feel like the weirdest thing ever. Mm. So. It's like walking and talking, isn't it? Some actors mm. just can't do it. Um, <laughs> but we did one, we did one show, um, first scene is about toast and Catherine didn't make any, so mm -hmm. that was, <laughs> was well, an odd experience. It, it, it was just, the there was no though, toast. Well, so he <laughs> didn't had, have any. It looked like I, I seriously lost well. my mind. <laughs> <laughs> kept talking about Through toast. An abstract piece of work then, yeah. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, tomorrow, as the director, at what point do you step back and oh, give a pair of... We're waiting. <laughs> we're waiting. We're still waiting. <laughs> you know, the very first thing I ever did was I shadowed um, two directors on an opera in Brighton when I was 17. It's, it's the moment when I fell in love with directing. And they said to me, um, at the end of that process, if you remember nothing else, um, remember these two things, that as a director, always say thank you and always know when to say goodbye. Mm. And I think that's a, a it, it stayed with me because um, the always say thank you, you, as a director, you are helming this ship and there are a whole bunch of people on it who are striving and working day and night to create a thing um, to essentially to your vision. I mean, I don't hold with director as dictator, but it, essentially they're all doing stuff um, under your leadership, I guess. And so remembering to say thank you lots is really important. Um, and, and knowing when to say goodbye, I think applies kind of throughout the process. There are moments um, when you're rehearsing a scene and actually you just need to put it to bed for a bit and let the ideas percolate. I think there are moments when uh, at the end of the day, you might want to do a thing again, but you just need to stop because everyone's a bit knackered and the next time, you know, if you do run it again, it's just not going to help at all. And then, yeah, I think there's a really important moment that is now, actually, when as a director, if you've done your job right, it's theirs. And, and press night is always bittersweet for me because um, 
it's, it is the moment when it becomes theirs and when it isn't mine anymore. Um, and, and that is beautiful. Um, and it's also really sad because with a lovely company like, like this one, you don't want to walk away. Mm. I, I have a, a slightly uh, different relationship with a play now that I'm an artistic director because I'm still up in the building and there's a tannoy in the corridor just outside my office so I can kind of listen mm. in if I'm working late. Um, but I do think it's really important to let it be the companies and to allow them ownership to, to you know, to to absolutely encourage them to have ownership of it. Also, because we're going into the Dorfman, we're going to be back in the tech, so it doesn't feel quite like... Um, yeah, it's not a, a, a complete sort of, farewell. Yeah, because yeah, I've mm. had directors that you just don't see again, and I find that mm. a little bit discombobulated, to be honest, mm. when you've... Yeah. You won't be one of those, I don't think. No, no and, and actually, I, I tend to try and see a show um, regularly through its run because... It's a live piece of theatre, and it can get stretched sometimes in a, in, in a slightly odd direction. Or you, I would never expect, nor indeed want, any of the actors to feel like they needed to keep an outside eye on it. Um, and so I and my brilliant um, assistant director Hannah Noon can be that outside eye and can and yeah. can make sure that as a whole it is kind of holding together. We even all if we all need to check happening. in, don't we? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Richard will be giving me notes. <laughs> Shows time. Or He's looks. Not Give it notes or looks. <laughs> 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 but also we we have a very good. Um, I, I think that stage managers on this job, the three of them, yeah. uh, have been a real rock for mm. for us as actors. Uh, Quite rare, actually. I mean, I, you get close to them, but they've been really sort of looking after us really well mm -hmm. and guiding us and telling us what to do next a lot. Mm -hmm. Cassie, I mean, I, I honestly, I, every time I go into the wings, I have no idea what's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> or what I'm supposed to be taking. And, and she's got a million and one things to, to do. Yeah. And she always, always stops what she does and makes sure, you know, and mm -hmm. it's not because I'm needy, it's just because I'm absent-minded, that's all. And, <laughs> and, and, and the three of them, you know, I just have been so... Mm. And also Stevie on the out front, you know, if I was, sometimes our egos got too big or something, she would bring us back down to earth. Again. So it's been very much, it's, it, we all feel like siblings in lots of ways. And, they are yeah, amazing. We could never, ever have done, we couldn't do this without yeah. them. Could we? The award-winning Stevie Hayton. Yeah, well. Mm. She just won uh, the Stage Management Association Award for uh, Best Stage Management Team <laughs> um, for her work. Uh, on what well, the, the team won for their work on the assassination of Katie Hopkins that was the show in here before. Um, we have time for one more question. So, you know, yes, at the back there. Yes, yeah, uh, for me, the set has been fantastic. Um, it's probably the biggest set I've seen on this stage for about 30 years. Um, and just how did you get that quality and how did it come about? Uh, uh, well, Short answer, the workshop team here at Theatre Cluid, Workshop and Scenic, um, who are incredible. Um, we're very, very privileged that we are one of the few theatres in the country who still have a full workshop, a full wardrobe team, a scenic artist, a props maker um, on staff. Uh, and so we can make theatre in the truest and fullest sense of the word. Um, uh, so they made it. Um, and and brilliantly on this one, as I've said, in, in co-production with the National Theatre. And so uh, the National Theatre team um, did, the, did the drawings for it, sent those up here. Our team here made it. Together, we'll take it down to the South Bank. Um, so, yeah, uh, both, both teams who are absolutely at the top of their game. Mm. Oh, it's hugely important because you sort of, it, it really, you just believe it, you know. I mean, the lighting and, and the music, I've, I've, I've never had a tech where it's just felt like everything has been coming together so mm. beautifully and, and everyone, everyone tomorrow likes to have an op quite an open rehearsal room, so everybody had been coming into mm. rehearsal and it felt very much that they were supporting what, what we were doing. Mm. Sometimes you can get into technical rehearsal and then it can feel a bit sort of like everyone's doing great work but it's not together and it felt very mm. much like we were all, you know... And we, we've never had together. to compromise anything we've done um, that we did, you know, on a flat surface in the National with chalk or tape, you know, which 
represented the set as it was going to be. We've never had to compromise any of our moves or what we no. do. And, and it, sometimes what happens is you rehearse and rehearse and you get to the set and it's, you know, sometimes lots of things are smaller or it's wider or it's bigger. Mm -hmm. You've got to change what you do. And it's, this has just been like going from uh, as, as duck to water. It is so easy. It's just both an easy transition. We are going so many things, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm? We've already got our eye on what we're stealing from the set. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a long list of people who want to steal this set. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to go down south first. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Sadly, that's all we have time for. And thank you to everyone who joined us uh, in the ether. Um, <laughs> we'll hope to do more of these. And it's really wonderful that you are all playing such a part in supporting the work that we do here at Theatre Cluid and across the country. Um, and my huge thanks to Catherine and Richard for coming in the day after press night, pre-show, <laughs> to do this for us. So thank, thank you. you very much indeed.